can't stop thinking about the solar system, about Earth. It was never my home. That honor belongs to Eden, wherever that may be. It's such a complicated topic. You think human, you think Earth. That's just how it's ingrained into the collective unconscious. But there is no Earth. Not anymore. Beacons surround the planet, broadcasting warnings to all those who approach. It's a wasteland filled with concrete thorns bursting from the ground, mazes of black concrete monoliths that spread across the landscape. No patch of land is left untainted by radioactive waste and toxic pollutants. No ocean not made poison by the calloused hand of corporate greed. No amount of terraforming can heal a planet that broken. The death of Earth was not one of furious nuclear fire. It was instead a pathetic and gradual death rattle caused by willful ignorance and avarice. No one in living memory is from Earth. But there's still this misguided association with it. I'm sure over time, through a multi-generational game of telephone, all the bad about Earth could be forgotten, and people will begin to idolize something that never was. That's what I think birthed the Anthronesians. A desire to return to an idealized version of the past because you don't like the state of the present. There's a guard outside my cell. He doesn't seem like the rest of the Anthronesians to me. He shies away from those more committed when they pass and doesn't hold himself with the same menacing demeanor. The door is made of an opaque glass that lets me see their side profile. My cell is filled with propaganda books, nothing I wish to waste my time reading, and a short metal desk. I knock on the door, I back against the wall which bows outward slightly to get the best view of my captor. Hey, I say. They ignore me. What's your deal then? You from the solar system like the rest of them. They continue to ignore me. Come on man, I just want to get to know you. They move ever so slightly. Seems like we're going to be spending a lot of time together, right? Ras Tiranovi. He says, finally, seemingly reluctant to offer up the information. That's a hydroponic station, right? What's it like? I don't remember, really. I was born there, but... It, when the council started relocating because of the overpopulation crisis, we got taken to a Vietorian farming colony. Stymphalia. Oh, that must have been hard. It was. <clears throat> they say, a little too enthusiastically. It was. They do things so differently, and we didn't speak the language. So, yet. how'd you end up with them? I say, cutting him off before he goes on a rant. A gesture to a group of far more menacing looking Anthronesians. Well, I was on a Corsair vessel. We crashed on this planet, and so we took up in a small village. We had loads of weapons and stuff, so when the Anthronesians came and offered refuge for any humans, I, I thought, it's gotta be better than this, and it was. I always hated the council. I mean, why do I have to share with Viatorium? What about the rest of your crew? Well, none of them were human and they fought back, so yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You must miss your friends. Oh, I wasn't friends with them. I just worked in the kitchen. Do you, do you think you could do me a favor? I, I don't think... He says reluctantly. Just hear me out, okay? All right. He says cautiously. Can you bring my bandolier? It's got some medication I need to take. What kind? It's, uh, immortal stuff. I need it or my bones melt. Now go get my bandolier. I, uh, I can feel it coming on. Quick! The initiate runs off in a panic and I pause for a moment, unsure if I actually manage to get away with that before I get to my preparations. Each of the heartbeats will be monitored by the ship's AI, so using one of the more lethal artifacts is out of the question. Something comes to mind, and I wait. The group of Anthronesians leave and the guard returns with my bandolier. He opens the bowed glass door and hands it to me. I take out a white stone icon of a beetle and hold it up. It begins to rattle and emanate a strange energy. A look of dismay covers his face. Oh, you were tricking me, weren't you? Yep, I say. You fucking... I cut him off before he can finish his insult. A line of white stone extends from the icon, strikes the guard, and he is instantly calcified. His face frozen in an expression of betrayal and meathead anger. The icon of Saint Tartarese is an unpleasant one. Under the calcified exterior, the guard's heart still beats at a regular rate. Aside from the lack of movement, everything would seem normal to an observing AI. Anyone looking at him, of course, would see the calcified skin and muscle, but hopefully by the time that happens, I'll have done... something. My path is still annoyingly unclear. Destroy the dissimulation field. A mantra I've been repeating to myself for the past few days in captivity aboard this vessel. The ASC Barakiel. I don't know what has happened while I've been on this planet. If Darjami is still even around, what havoc of Vignadal might have caused. It may already be too late, but... Judging by the fact that concepts aren't just floating around with no relation to each other, that the laws of cause and effect are still intact, and that I still recognize the universe around me, that is not the case. I leave the brig and find myself in a corridor. There's an electronic sign displaying directions to various rooms and systems. 
The sign cycles through several archaic languages. I see what I'm looking for. Armory. I head in the direction, keeping highly aware of the sounds of approaching footsteps. I don't know what time it is on this cruiser. It certainly won't be using the council-regulated set time due to the Anthronesian hatred of everything Limonian. The reason I'm so eager to know as I slink around the long, oddly shaped hallways of the supercruiser is that I don't want to be caught during a changeover. On a ship this size, it makes no sense to have everyone share the same timetable. So, depending on its population, a military vessel will have up to five different day cycles at once, meaning the systems that are physically manned are done so consistently. If I get caught during one of those changeovers, it's back to square one. I enter the armory, one of many I'm sure, and find it surprisingly empty. It feels almost as if the supercruiser is drastically understaffed. The main runway and essential facilities are well maintained, but there are great stretches of empty corridor and seemingly important rooms left unattended. Perhaps that explains their keenness to recruit new forces from the surrounding area. I approach the terminal. At least, I think it's a terminal. The screen sits in a thick cylindrical tube with a second metal tube set beneath it, acting as a way to navigate the system. In order to work it, you must place your hands on the sides and twist. A design extremely antithetical to how a human expects a computer to work. There are indents for fingers where you would expect, but the layout overall is so... strange. I place my hands on the sides of the cylinder and navigate through the inventory system. Sword or gun, sword or gun, sword or gun. Why not both? I mumble to myself as I select a nice looking sword and a submachine gun from the listing. The printers at the side of the room activate, and by the time I go over they've printed. I grab the sword, submachine gun and ammunition and go to leave. I exit the room and turn to continue down the hall when I run into two Anthronesians who have yet to spot me, engrossed in their conversation. There's this new recruit. She seems promising. Which one? Uh, Scheiben. Teresa Scheiben. Oh yeah, she's great. They stop in their tracks as I draw my sword. For a moment we stop and just stare at each other. If you just turn and walk away, I begin. But the first Anthronesian draws her firearm and so I swing at her with my sword. She takes a step back and the second one tries to restrain me. I draw the SMG and open fire before he can grab me. The sound reverberates down the hall. My cover now being blown, I turn to the first soldier and swing my sword at the sidearm in her hand, knocking it away. I point my firearm at her and she holds up her hands. Aren't you gonna shoot me? Depends. The soldier glances down at her fallen comrade. Um? How high of a security clearance you have? Her eyes focus on the gun and I gesture with it. Well? I was up to become the next dagger of Nemesis. What's your name? Cryover Iwa. Well, Cryova. Do you think you'd be able to get me into that chamber at the center of the ship? You mean the Tenezid? Yeah, sure. I'm assuming you'll shoot me otherwise? Yeah, I say, grateful for the suggestion. Are you sure? Yes, I say, with more confidence. She turns and we begin to march down the hall. A group of Anthonesians rush down and take stock of the situation. They lower their weapons and let us pass. Just shoot him in the back. I hear one whisper to the other. I'm a mortal dipshit, they shout behind me, bluffing. If they did fire on me, I'd probably collapse from the pain, but they take me at my word and we move out into the large, cavernous space. It's dead silent. Everyone there stands and watches us pass. The balconies that line the sides of the room holding even more forces pointing rifles down at me. Even the scientists hold some kind of weapon. We reach the huge doorway and I nudge Cryova. Well, open the door. Oh, I can't open the door. Only the sword can do that. So what was your plan? Bring you out here, let you get shot to shit, Presumably die in the crossfire. But I won't die. <sighs> yeah. But it'll stop whatever you were going to do, and... Well... You were going to shoot me anyway, right? I tighten the grip on my weapon and go to pull the trigger, at least taking a fascist with me before my escape attempt fails. But the door clicks and opens slowly onto an empty lift. I take a few steps back onto the platform, not looking the proverbial gift horse in the mouth. Keep my weapon trained on cry over as the door starts to shut. She turns and meets my eyes. Good luck. The lift starts to rise, moving forward and up, and I ready myself. Sword in one hand, submachine gun in the other. I fear just destroying the dissimulation field will not be enough, and so I intend to begin a manifestation and then destroy it. That pillar is what's creating it, I'm sure. The lift jolts and the doors open. I tense and swing my sword down and onto the blade of a hellbird, wielded by the sword of Nemesis. She pushes towards me and I step back and fire. Her armor absorbs the shock and she pauses. I take a moment to bring my sword down at her neck, but she recovers in time and jabs her weapon at me. The room is empty as we fight. The lab in the corner of the room is scattered with equipment, and a half-constructed angel core rifle sat on the altar. 
The sword hits my side with the end of her pole arm and I hunch down in reaction to the pain. She lifts the strange looking halberd above her head and swings it down. I meet the blade with mine, hurry it to the ground and swing the submachine gun up, pointing it directly at the sword. Through the mask I meet her gaze and I pull the trigger. Blood pours outward from a large bullet hole in her mask and she slumps over. I stand and return my sword to its sheath. The console in front of me hums into life after I flick a few switches, remembering what the scientists did to begin the manifestation. I stare down at the golden pillar, an artifact of some unknown origin that generates the dissimulation field. I find a visor that the Anthronesian scientists were wearing. It fits nicely despite my horns. I open the airlock and make my way down the metal walkway. The atmosphere around me filled with the noble gases. I wade through the water. The pillar thrums with a divine energy. I cannot imagine how a bunch of human supremacists that worship Earth got a hold of it. I raise my gun and hear a shattering above me. I look up to see the form of the Sword of Nemesis diving towards me. I step away and she lands where I stood. With a ferocity to her actions that I had not seen before, she swings at me. I just barely manage to block and parry. She stops, her breathing laboured. You do not know what you toy with here. Her voice takes on a strange quality. We are blessed. You may slay me now, but I answer to something greater. I'm going to put a stop to this little project of yours. The Anthronesians will die here. She begins to laugh. <laughs> you think this is it? Our armies are vast. I stand among a faction of untold numbers. We are everywhere. The fact that you think that this small act will impede the inevitable progress of the Anthronesians shows just how unprepared your kind are. I pull the trigger and the room fills with a white light. takes place seems to do so in a vast white space, entirely separate from the world around us. Seemingly in slow motion I watch everything around me disassemble. The walls delaminate to reveal the rest of the ship in a slow state of disassembly. Machines and weapons break apart into their composite parts, wires separate from casings, railings unweld, the metal frame of the ship shatters. I see people in a similar frozen state of unwrap. Clothes unstitch and unravel, skin separates from flesh, flesh unwinds from bone, bones unjoin and separate. Their internal organs float up into the air like kite strings. In front of me, a shape, hazy and unfocused, becomes apparent. fills me with awe and calms my heart. The complete ruin of everything does not faze me as I stare at this form. The shape solidifies, a tall and slender figure, dressed in grey robes of an unidentifiable material. In each of their eight arms they hold an ornate skull of a different creature, each hollow and wearable as a mask. They place the black skull of a wolf-like creature to their face, and with their free hand grab the sword of Nemesis. His flesh has not begun to unwrap. They lift her up and meet her gaze. The ornate bronze mask shatters, the shards slowly floating away. Her face young but rotting, and her eyes glowing blue, totally and entirely. Your sword fails into something, the shape says, and I fall to my knees. The inexplicable longing and devotion in my very soul. To be investigated later, they say, lifting the sword of Nemesis, who is pulled through a black hole that forms above her head. The shape removes the wolf skull and replaces it with that of a large rodent. He turns to me. Meet the gaze of your creator, Adam. I lift my head and meet the gaze of Epicurosa in their common form, the only form I had ever known. I feel as if I am staring into a bright light. My eyes sting and water, but I cannot look away. It's not often I cry away from my celestial form. You've done well here, but your work is not done, as I'm sure you're aware. It really is a pleasant surprise to find you. It works out quite nicely, actually. Come. Compelled by some internal force, I stand and follow Epicurosa. 
Light upon serenity, I begin. She is holding heart's problem, she means nothing to me. She opens the second larger black hole for us to step through. The white light that fills the world disappears and the floating components of the ship begin to fall. The unraveled corpses collapse to the ground alongside weapon parts and scraps of cloth. A strange scene for the scavengers to pick apart. We are pulled through the black hole and into an office in a world of corporate toys, pens and papers. The human receptionist looks up at Epicurosa, who swaps their rodent skull mask for a decorated black goat skull, missing a horn. They bend down to the receptionist's level. I believe I made an appointment. Receptionist nods. The god gestures to the doorway. May I? The receptionist nods again. Thank you. We enter the office. The high floor-to-ceiling window presents a view of Azil, the artificial stellar system the humans call home. The walls of the office are lined with paintings and artifacts, the oldest and most expensive being remnants of Earth, and the newer pieces being from various human colonies. Sat at a desk is the human representative, Alexander Ashton. Ah, Picuroso. How wonderful it is to see you. He begins before his eyes start to meet. Adam? Where the hell have you been? We searched everywhere on Dodge and Mean and found no trace of you. I go to speak, but Epicurosa holds up her free hand and I say nothing. The adoration and enthrallment I felt when looking at them has begun to die down the longer they hold their common form, but I still do not dare to interrupt or ignore them. The god says to the senator, I have come to relieve you of Adam Delta V. He has important work to attend to with me. The senator leans forward. His time under the council is not up. He still belongs to us. It was not you who indentured him. You have no right to take him. Ignoring the senator's extremely daring words, I look up at Epicurosa, who looks down at me through the eye sockets of the goat skull. What do you need from me that you cannot do? Epicurosa looks out of the window, seeing more than all mortals have and ever will see, understanding more than all the great scholars and scryers ever have and ever will. To me the realms are equal. The physical materials that make you up hold no bearing over the intellectual and moral ones. And so the death of the non-divine such as yourself often holds as much significance to me as forgetting an idea. It is a shame, but another will take its place. But not you, Adam Delta V. Something has turned its benevolent gaze upon you. Something greater than me. And so I enact its will. They pause for but a moment, for reasons so beyond my realm of comprehension, it wastes time even thinking about thinking about it. Our universe exists on a set path. Ultimately, one atom bounces off another at a predictable angle, cause and effect, etc. We are all the man locked in the bedroom. We think we want to stay, but in the end we have no choice in the matter. One thing causes another with no unpredictable insertions into this sequence. However, that is only applicable within the way our universe is constructed. For something that has come from outside of this, the laws are not so binding. By entering our universe, Ovid Nadal has provided an unpredictable insertion. He has disrupted the chain of being, the predetermined order of events and entities in the universe, the complex order of orders. For a mortal, chaos is something that can be half imagined and dismissed, but true and utter unpredictability is horrifying to a god. And it would seem you are important to ceasing this endless horror. My goddess, I ask that you understand. The council is not in the good graces of the galactic population. Our mishandling of the population crises means we need a win. It's far more than just that fiasco, I say. The senator shoots me a look and continues. To have a BIOS that solved the universe threatening problem would be a great triumph. No. The god says tersely and begins to usher me out of the room. The senator, now flustered, bangs his fist on the table. Epicuroso! My progenitor! On behalf of the Rhetories and the Council of Nemonia, I pray to you and request that Adam stays with us. A dark anger covers their form. They exchange the goat skull for that of a large cat, spin and slam four of their fists, skull still in hand, onto the white metal desk, denting it in two places. You pray to me. You wish to control me through worship. As you did the forces of nature you worshipped in your early history. You feel that you can sway and change my actions through sheer force of will, don't you? I am just as indifferent, if not more so, than hurricanes and earthquakes and typhoons, for they simply exist. I make the active choice to ignore you. I... If you speak once more, you insolent mortal, I will eviscerate you. You shall be annulled. Your destruction shall be so righteous and glorious that ever more the name... They lean forward, stooping down to read the nameplate on his desk. 
Alexander Ashton will only ever be associated with complete and total annihilation. And whatever administrative loopholes you close and lives you think you have changed by shifting currency to and fro will forever be overshadowed by your wondrous undoing. Do you doubt my power to do such a thing? The senator shakes his head, somehow by some miracle maintaining his composure. In this moment, I feel a newfound respect for Alexander. Even in the face of his very creator, he sticks to his duty and tries to serve the council. Epicurus opens up another portal. Before we step through, I look up at them. Where are we going? I ask. Somewhere I will be able to understand some things about you. A great many forces have coalesced to support you, Adam. More than just the Retorees and their attempted deification. But the true divine. Before all that, I must see if you are ready. She steps through. I turn to look at Alexander Ashton one last time. He stands and stares out of his window, watching those he was charged with protecting. They are there in front of him. He's just unable to perceive it all. In that respect, I feel we are alike. I turn back and follow Epicurosa through the portal. The Rostirian Guard was played by Adol Rafai. Cryova Iwa was played by Betris Jones. Anthronesian 1 played by David M. Sledge. Anthronesian 2 played by Tomix. Sword of Nemesis played by Lucy Campbell. Epicurosa, played by Laura Rogers. Alexander Ashton, played by Jonathan Orloy. Sound design writing and Adam Delta 5, played by Kai Gwillem Pritchard. An extra special thanks to our patrons, Teresa Scheiben and Anthony Hyde. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Follow the podcast on Twitter at chainofbeing. And subscribe to the Patreon for exclusive content and rewards. And thank you for listening. Hey, I'm Brad, and if you like D&D and fantasy stories with lots of magic, adventure, strange beasts, and oddball characters, and comedians with New Zealand accents, then oh boy, have I got just the show for you. The Fate of Ison is a podcast that has, wait for it, all of those things. Remember those things I mentioned? It's got all of them! Now go listen to The Fate of Ison because it's good and you deserve good things. Fate of Ison, a proud member of the Necropodicon Network. Necropodicon. Hard to pronounce? Easy to listen.